we're here today to talk about the state of education funding in Arizona. Um, when we were thinking about putting this um, panel together way back in the spring, um, a lot of us were thinking about um, the budget cuts in Arizona in general and how they have affected our lives because a lot of us have been uh, really impacted um, by the, the low taxes and budget cuts, which is a kind of endemic to this state. Um, so this, we decided though to focus on education because it seems to be really, I think, the most important issue as far as budget cuts go. It's one that everybody has been talking about since back in 2017 when um, teachers across the state walked out. And you know, this is happening in other states too, but we are one of the states that's always the lowest on the list for teacher pay, for um, rates of you know, too many students in the classroom okay, per teacher. All kinds of, of issues like that were often at the bottom. Um, so we wanted to, to think about this in, a, in kind of a comprehensive way, one to invite experts who know a lot about this issue because it is so complicated. Um, in doing the research for this, I was really surprised by how many different laws, um, propositions, um, court cases, these things keep popping up and they're, they're kind of hard to keep track of. Um, but in order to stay informed, we, we need to do that. Um, and then a little, another fun fact for you guys, uh, did you know that Arizona is the second fastest growing state in the country? Um, yeah, only Utah is, is uh, attracting more people. And so this is, has a huge impact on the state, um, and especially because the people that we attract are often seniors who are looking for places that they live can live that I'm sure a lot of you have come here for this reason. I came here because of the low cost of living is one of the reasons I wanted to move here. Um, and the low taxes are, are part of that. It's, it's an attractive thing for a lot of people, but it does have costs. And that's one thing that we want to think about. What are the actual costs of living in a low tax state? And what it specifically are, are the costs to education? Um, so you'll hear our panels talk today about a lot of different things. I know that they're gonna go over um, some of these laws, um, issues like, like we have these, uh, a thing called the Arizona School Facility Board. They're the ones who, who figure out what can we give to schools as far as um, for construction and renovations. We have things like Proposition 301, which increased the state sales tax by just 0.6%. This is supposed to bring a lot of funding, but and it's supposed to increase um, according to inflation, but the state legislature just pretty much ignores it. Um, we have tax credits that are doing things, you know, they're really great for um, uh, schools in wealthy districts because you can donate you know money to certain public schools and then get a tax break and that's wonderful for wealthy school districts it's really terrible for for the poor school districts and it results in a lot of inequalities um, we also have proposition 123 we we're just talking about this beforehand that was passed a few years ago and it was supposed to, to bring in some money from the state land trust for education and there was just a court case I think it was last week the week before that said, no, this is illegal. So we don't really know how that's, that's gonna affect things, but I think we'll probably talk about that. And then WC also, our, our governor came up with a plan in response to those teacher walkouts to increase teacher pay. It's called the 20 by 2020 plan to increase teacher pay by 20%, which we think probably a good start, but not enough. Um, so our panelists today, I'm gonna introduce them all quickly. Um, David Luhan, who's director of the Center for Economic, Economic Progress, he's also a former state legislature, um, both in the House and the Senate. Um, he'll talk about kind of this overview of how did we get here, especially since the Great Recession, which really affected things, and why have we had a nod bounce back from that. Um, Lisa Cervantes, she's the CAO of the Vail School District, and she's going to give us um, some specifics about Vail, which is a really interesting district because it's growing so fast. I'm going to up with that. You know, second fastest growing um, state in the nation, and, and how are they adjusting things? How are they reacting to budget cuts in that district? And then we have John Pettigrew, who is he's retired from TUSD and Florida Wells School District. He was an administrator of both of those districts. But he's going to talk about how does this affect the real world in Arizona? How does it affect the business community? How does it affect our workforce? Um, so David Luhan will go first. Um, I'm going to give his full bio. <laughs> um, he's the director of the Center of the Arizona Center for Economic Progress. He served in both the, the House and the Senate in the Arizona Legislature. He was an assistant attorney general advising the school facility boards, which I just mentioned before. 
before. Um, and he was the legal counsel for the Arizona Senate. Um, he served as a staff attorney, um, providing legal services uh, for abused and neglected children. He also was the public policy director for Reading Partners, an organization that provides services to young children who are struggling in schools. Um, and he was the chief administrator um, for ASU's uh, Preparatory Academy in Phoenix, which is a public charter school. Um, and he has earned his law degree at the Sondra Day O'Connor uh, College of Law at ASU. So please help me welcome David Kumar. Thank you. Good morning. Um, yeah, I, I want to start by saying it's really encouraging to see so many people coming to hear about education funding in Arizona, taking, taking time out of your Saturday morning because it is such a, a critical issue to the future of our state. Uh, my presentation this morning, you're going to see, uh, covers a lot about taxes. Uh, and that is because if, if you are not looking at how we handle taxes in Arizona, you are missing a significant part of the story about how we fund our public schools because it is very much uh, a key factor in our education funding formula. So um, in Arizona, slide, um, the Arizona legislature has cut taxes every single year since 1990. Every year since 1990, and those red uh, lines basically indicate how much revenue we are losing from the state from all of those tax cuts. Um, it's hard to see, but basically we have $2.8 billion less in annual revenue because of all of those tax cuts. Actually, if you adjust that for inflation, because it's happened over the years, it's almost $5 billion less in annual revenue. So we would have, without all of those tax cuts, an additional $5 billion annually. Um, and just to give you some perspective, our state budget is only about $11 billion. So, so all of those tax cuts have had a very significant impact. Next slide. Um, and our legislature continued it this past legislative session. We went in in January, we had a billion dollar uh, revenue surplus that could have been put towards education and towards a lot of needs um, and instead, our, our legislature had one of the biggest tax cuts in state history, almost uh, $386 million in new permanent tax cuts, which continues just to drain those revenues. And I'll talk at the end of my presentation uh, on why that is so significant. And, and so all of those tax cuts, people like to say that Arizona is a low tax state. And uh, it is a low tax state for some, but for most of us, actually, it's not. Um, there's an organization out of uh, Washington, D.C. that monitors all state tax codes called ITEP. And basically, um, because all of those tax cuts over the years, many of those tax cuts have, so we get, there's three types of taxes where the state basically gets our revenue. Income tax, property tax, and sales tax. Many of those tax cuts over the years have been to income tax or to property tax, which has put more and more reliance on the sales tax. And the sales tax impacts the lower income people more disproportionately, negatively impacts them than people at the top. And so our tax code, if you are in the lowest income of Arizona, you pay the sixth highest state and local taxes in the country, if you are near the, if you're uh, in the 20 to 30,000, 40,000 income range, your taxes are the sixth highest in the country. But if you're in the wealthiest one percent of Arizona's Arizonans, you are in a low tax state. Uh, you pay the 40th highest, and so that's because of our over reliance on the sales tax. Um, but it's also a low tax state for corporations in Arizona. 74% of our corporations pay $50 or less in state income tax. 74% of our corporations are paying $50 or less in state income tax. So you know, I served in the legislature for eight years. Before that, I was on staff. And I have been around for many of those tax cuts annually since 1990. And I can tell you, if you were to take sound bites, from every one of those proponents of those tax cuts every year, the sound bites are almost identical. And that is, 
we need this tax cut because it's going to bring more business and more jobs to Arizona. This is going to make our state wealthy. The tax cuts are going to pay for themselves because of all the new businesses that have come to our state. And so no state in Arizona has cut taxes more regularly, more consistently than Arizona. So we should be the most prosperous state. We shouldn't be having this education funding issue discussion if, if that was in fact the case. Um, but that isn't the case. And um, Alliance Bank, I'm, I'm gonna still a little bit of John Slender, but not too much, um, for the last three years, um, has done a survey of the top CEOs in Arizona asking them, what is the number one thing you want to see the legislature do? What's the biggest uh, hurdle that is impacting your business in Arizona? And every year for those that th that survey has been conducted, the answers have been consistent, and that is education, education, education. What is the number one business challenge? It's our education system and the quality of our workforce. Those are the two, those two things obviously are related. What's the number one issue that state government should address? The CEOs have consistently said our K-12 education system. What's the number one issue local government should address? Our K-12 education system. What's the number one thing that can improve your business climate? And the CEOs year after year say improve education funding. So that is what our business leaders are saying. And, and if you ask the people whose job it is, to go to other states and recruit businesses to come to Arizona. They will tell you, because they've told me and they've said it publicly, that when they go to other states and businesses express concerns about coming to Arizona, they're not talking about taxes and that our taxes are too high and that we need to have more tax cuts. The biggest concern they will tell you that is they hear over and over again about why they are reluctant to come to Arizona is the quality of our public education system and the quality of our workforce. Those are the big things and those are obviously related. And so Arizona uh, funding of public education today, um, and I can get these PowerPoints so you can read it a little bit clearer, but basically the bottom red line shows how education, state funding of public education has gone, and this the, it starts at 2001, and it goes over to 2019. <coughs> and basically you can see that our schools today have less funding, not just what, than a decade ago, they have less funding today per pupil than they had back in 2001. Um, and as you heard, we have the fastest growing, one of the fastest growing states in the country. And so that is a real, real crisis. Um, and it's not like back in 2008, in 2001, we were doing a great job of funding public education. In 2008, in 2000, 2008, we were 44th in the country in how we fund public education. We're now at 49th, 50th, you know, in that in that range, depending on, on who you look at. So, so we are uh, well below where we should be. Just, uh, I should also say, people ask, you know, well, what is the number to get us to the national average? How much money would we have to put in annually to get us to the national average? Um, I think it's about $3 billion is the last I heard. So that'll give you some perspective of how short we are just to get to the national average, $3 billion annually. Um, I'm gonna actually skip this one, but I hope we can talk about, I know, I think Lisa's gonna talk about it, I think John is. I'm talking about classroom funding. There's a whole other issue when it comes to school facilities and the inequities that are being created. There's lots of lawsuits going on, uh, but hopefully we'll talk about that in, in some of our other comments. So Arizona has not always been below the national average when it comes to funding public education. This actually, the line starts here on this chart going back to almost when we became a state in 1930. And from about 1930 until about 1990, we were above the national average in funding public education. It wasn't until about 1990 that we fell below the national average. Do you remember what else I said we started to do around 1990? We started cutting taxes every single year. Um, and that's about the time we started to fall below the national average. There's another chart that I usually will show and I didn't include it with this, but that chart shows uh, post-secondary attainment, how we're doing in terms of people going to college. 
and getting college degrees. We are below the national average in post-secondary attainment, but we weren't always behind the national average. Um, from about 1930 until about 2000, we were above the national average. It wasn't until about 10 years after we fell below the national average in funding K-12 education that we started, we fell below the national average in post-secondary attainment. So it makes total sense to me that 10 years after we started funding our public schools, post-secondary attainment fell below the national average as well. So I think you can see that they could all be fairly much related. Um, and, and we're struggling. Um, you know, when it comes to our educational measurements, I think we're starting to see um, the impacts in, in terms of fourth grade reading proficiency, fourth grade graduation, we're falling further below the national average. And, and not to say that funding public education is the only answer. There's a lot of other things when it comes to um, academic success. But when you are struggling already, and you're below the national average on many of these measures, when you're also having giving your schools less resources to deal with these issues, you're just making it uh, more and more difficult. And, and here I think is a very sobering slide. This talks about incarceration. Arizona for many years has had one of the fastest, highest incarceration rates in the, in the country. And what this slide shows, it actually compares uh, most of the countries around the world. Um, and the U so you have Russia, Af South Africa, Australia, that's their incarceration rate per 100,000 people. The blue is the US rate, and then the red is Arizona. We have the second highest incarceration rate in Arizona. We actually spend more, give more money, state general fund dollars to the Department of Corrections than we give to the University of Arizona, Arizona State University, and Northern Arizona University combined. We give more money to the Department of Corrections than we give to all three of our state universities. And I don't have to tell you, I don't think, about how ominous that is for our future as a state, the future of our workforce, if we're not addressing this. Um, and think about if we do address this, how we could shift the dollars that we're spending to incarcerate to our education system, whether it's higher ed or K-12 or early childhood. Um, so that's a big issue. Um, uh, this basically shows that our corporate income tax revenue has been declining consistently over the years, and, and that's attributable to 74% of our corporations paying $50 or less in state income taxes. Um, you also heard, next slide, um, that tax credits, uh, tax credits are like tax cuts. We love tax credits in Arizona, um, but they give people uh, opportunities to basically take their taxes that they owe to the state and give it to you know, charities or give it to private schools Private schools are one of the fastest growing tax credits that we have. Basically what you see is tax credits are growing four, uh, almost what, four times faster than our K-12 education budget, than our state budget overall. Um, and, and just to give you a sense, um, corporations, this is where corporations are reducing their tax liability to the state. We have R&D tax credits. We have tax credits to private schools. We have all kinds of tax credits. Corporations are giving away so much of the tax revenue they owe to the state in the form of tax credits that they can't even use all of those tax credits. Most of our tax credits allow companies, if they don't have enough tax liability, to hold on to those tax credits and save them for future years when they do have tax liability they can hold on to them for as much as 12 years. And right now on the books, corporations are holding over a billion dollars in tax credit balances that they haven't used yet that they can use in future years. So tax credits uh, are a big problem. I'm gonna actually skip not only this slide, but if you go to the next one. Um, it was mentioned about public school tax credits. You know, this is one that we actually, often many of us, I've given uh, tax credits to our public schools. Um, but as was mentioned before, even those tax credits are problematic in that it creates uh, more and more inequities in our schools. This is from the uh, Department of Revenue. Basically, if you're a school that has um, fewer than 25% of your students that are low income on free and reduced lunch, 
those schools on average are getting $91 per student in tax credits. Whereas the, the low income schools, the schools that have more than 75% of their students on free and reduced lunch, low income schools, they're only getting $13 per student in tax credits. So that's creating more and more of these inequities. Uh, the other last piece I wanna to touch are sales tax loopholes. So I said we have more and more reliance on sales tax in Arizona, but the legislature, all those tax cuts, many of the tax cuts they've been giving away are not to you and I. They are to special interests, to people that have lots of money to go down to the legislature and give certain industries lots of tax credit loopholes. And these are just some of my favorite. Um, one of my favorites is uh, horse vitamins. Uh, if you own a horse in Arizona, you do not have to pay sales tax on the vitamins for your horse. Uh, if you have a dog or a cat or most other kinds of pets, you have to pay sales tax on your vitamins. Uh, but horses, they do not, and that costs our general fund more than $7 million per year that could be going to schools and other things. <coughs> Private jet timeshares. Um, if th This is a thing I didn't even know existed, but if, if, you have a, if you're a wealthy person and you can't afford to uh, purchase your own private jet outright, you can do a timeshare where you go in with a bunch of other wealthy people and you buy a timeshare and thanks to the Arizona legislature, you will not have to pay sales tax on that timeshare. That also takes out uh, more, at least a million dollars per year. Um, you know, so there's all kinds of exemptions in our sales tax loopholes, which take out literally billions of dollars in revenue every year. So I just want to end uh, my depressing presentation <laughs> with uh, an even more depressing note. And, and that is, I don't have a chart on this, but um, okay, a slide. Okay. Um, you can go to the last slide. If okay. you but one other key thing, and, and that is why this is going to be so difficult to reverse. And that is, in 1992, the voters of Arizona passed a constitutional amendment that said that any time Arizona wants to, the legislature wants to raise taxes, it takes a two-thirds vote of both the House and the Senate. All of these tax loopholes and tax cuts, it only takes a simple majority of the legislature to pass it. But if you want to raise taxes, it takes a two-thirds vote. Since that passed in 1992, the legislature has not ever raised taxes in a, into, by a two-thirds vote. They've never been able to get to that. So even though many people say that our legislature is changing, the political dynamics are changing, I don't know if we're ever gonna get to the point where we have enough people in the legislature to get two thirds vote to raise taxes. And, and, and so 1992, that's again, that same time that our education funding started going down. So I think that's a real policy issue that we need to look at in Arizona about that super majority vote that's having a real impact in Arizona. So. Um, I'm going to talk about more positive things on the questions, I promise you, but uh, I thought you know, you'd really need to know about our tax policy because that, as you can see, has a real critical impact on how we fund our schools in Arizona. Thank you. Sorry, Chief Administrative Officer of the Vail uh, United School District, which are unified school district. Sorry, if you don't know, Vail is is right outside of Tucson. Um, Lisa is responsible for overseeing the human resources and financial operations for the district, and she began working at Vail in 2007 as the Director of Human Resources, and she's been the CAO since 2015. Um, Prior to, to working in, in, she was also, she's worked in uh, K through 12 education for 19 years overall. And she served as a senior human resources analyst and acting HR director for the Arizona Schools for the Deaf and Blind. And then she was the human resources director for the Tinker Verde School District. She has over 25 years experience in human resources and has a broad range of knowledge in the areas of compensation, benefits, recruiting and hiring, labor relations, complaint investigations, and coaching and counseling. She's a native Tucsonan, and she holds a bachelor's degree in business administration from the Eller College of Management at the U of A, and she also holds a senior designation, or designation of senior professional in human resources. Please help me in welcoming Lisa Sarkis. Thank you, Thank you very much.
much. Um, can everybody hear me great? Good, thumbs up. Um, so to piggyback on some depressing and maybe negative news that you might have heard, I have more to share. Um, I'm very thankful to be here and appreciate the invite and uh, thank you for all of you that might have given up some time on a very busy Saturday to join us and those that are watching the live stream. Um, first, I want to acknowledge, and I'm going to read through notes because I have facts and figures and I want to make sure I'm accurate. Um, I want to acknowledge that putting together a fiscally responsible state budget has got to be one of the most difficult um, and challenging uh, responsibilities I can think of. There are over 230 public school districts in the state of Arizona serving 1.2 million students, so it's a huge responsibility. I just have one school district with 13,000, so, and that's a full-time job. Second, I know there are um, a lot of comments and sentiments about you know, organizations, school districts, charters should live within their means. And I fully support that. I second it. I live it personally. I tell my kids the same thing when they post little pictures of, here's my peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I have to wait till payday. It's like, yeah, and let me show you the post where you were, you know, out gallivanting with friends on, you know, adult beverage night. So, um, you know, they don't get extra money from me if they don't choose to spend their money wisely. And I don't think schools or other businesses should um, be in line for a handout if they're not spending fiscally responsibly. But that's not the case with Vail and other, um, other school districts that are doing amazing things with our community's children. Um, Lynn, what I want to do is give you a very brief timeline similar to what, how David kind of backed it up, showing you that in the 90s taxes were cut. Well, things started happening in school districts in Arizona, also in the late 80s and early 90s. And that's where families and educational leaders started looking around and saying, wow, there's some inequalities in our school districts. The wealthy areas where there are the, the home values were, were significant and the, the homeowners were uh, earning more money and uh, there were uh, social economic advantages um, versus some of our other areas in the state that are poverty, uh, high poverty and <coughs> low socioeconomic demographics, English language learners, and their school didn't have the bigger better things and didn't have bigger better programs and couldn't afford to pay teachers that would deliver quality education and in 1994 there was a lawsuit that's how we in Arizona have to fix some of the school issues uh, Roosevelt Elementary School District filed a lawsuit school against Bishop and the Supreme Court said you're right there are in inequities and we need to fix the funding formula so 25 years ago a new funding formula was put in place and it's, it, I'm not gonna go through it, it's super complex, um, even for someone that's been in the business, and um, John Pettigone can attest to that. But basically, that funding formula says, we're gonna give every school state aid for an equalization assistance in a certain amount per pupil, and anything else the school needs to meet that budget capacity, the school has to raise from local taxes, commercial property taxes. And so today, the state gives public school districts, and I'm focusing on public school districts, not public charters or private schools, but public school districts get about $4,150 per pupil to uh, toward their maintenance and operation or general fund needs. And those cover people, salaries, payroll expenses, um, benefits. It also covers um, things that the district has to have, like liability insurance and pays for utilities and fuel. And we know that those costs have gone up over time. So funding for schools is maintenance and override through a per pupil and then taxpayer um, help. There's capital funding for things like transportation and textbooks and um, technology, curriculum and buildings, new buildings or fixing um, buildings that are aging and HVAC systems and things that break. Um, that's capital funding. And so we get a per pupil amount for capital funding as do charter schools. And then, um, you know, if we if the school needs more money in a growing district like Vail, we need money to help us build schools, then the school has to go out for a bond. And if they need more money for people or um, programs, then the school has to go out for an override. Just because the state funding isn't enough given these times to cover all those needs. And so I understand, I, I have a home in Tucson, I'm a taxpayer, and it feels like the school districts are just ring and re dry. But on the inside, knowing knowing some of the facts that we want to share with you today, it, 
if we could encourage the state legislature to undo some of those funding cuts and to undo some of the school funding restrictions, we wouldn't have to have our hand out every darn year because I don't like it on either side of the table. So what happened? In addition to those um, sales tax cuts and the property tax cuts that David shared, we had the 2008 Great Recession. And that caught everyone across the country, but especially in Arizona, flat-footed. So the Great Recession lasted from December 2007, if we probably all remember it very vividly, through June 2009. And during that time, it started with the burst of an $8 trillion housing bubble burst. So everybody, the housing prices were going up and then the market fell. And so um, that's how it started. In 2008 and 2009, the U.S. labor market lost 8.4 million jobs, or 6.1% of all payroll employment. People were suffering. People were losing houses and jobs and cars and had, having to move in with family members or having family members move in with them. Then while our community members were suffering, schools and other businesses started suffering as well. To balance the shortfall in revenue from tax cuts and from the sales tax because of the uh, recession, there was a solution proposed by then Governor Janet Brewer and the state legislature adopted it saying, let's slash public education funding. Right, on top of everything else, let's give it to them. So beginning 2009, um, instead of giving an annual inflation factor, which is in our constitution, that says school districts should receive an increase of either the inflation factor tied to Arizona's economy or 2%, whichever is less. The, the, the governor and the legislature said, no, we can't afford that, let's freeze that. So in a growing school district like Vail, more kids are coming, we're running out of seats and desks and need teachers and instructional supplies and buses and buses are aging and then buildings are falling apart or, or running down, we can't do preventive maintenance, we have to wait until it blows up. You know, now let's also cut your funding. Okay, well let's try to see if we can handle that. Um, so in 2010, the school leaders and some of the school business organizations got together and they filed what was called the inflation funding lawsuit. Again, we saw funding issues through lawsuits. Uh, in 2014, so 10 years later, schools are still struggling, inflation's still frozen. 2014, the Arizona Supreme Court said, you're right. That was unconstitutional, that was illegal. And the state should repay the school districts the funding they withheld. The state said, nah, we're not gonna do it. They refused to pay. So again, school districts were paying um, representatives to for the lawsuit, so we were paying to get money and not having money, it was still being frozen. From 2009 to 2015, almost five billion dollars were withheld illegally from the state from maintenance and operation or general fund funding to public school districts. The inflation funding lawsuit was settled in 2015. The, the schools had to settle for 70% of that money owed. And I, I, people were dumbfounded. Why did you give in? Why did you hold out? You owed that money. What do you mean you could, you know, well, if you could make it on 70%, well, maybe that's where we should set the money anyway, right? To live within your means. We're like, no, because we're paying and suffering for that loss of funding. We, some school districts had to close. Some school districts had to minimize their programs and go through staff reductions. They couldn't afford their teachers. They couldn't afford to teach their community students anymore. And so we're saying 70% is better than continuing to get a poke in the eye. Let's take it. And so we settled. And there was money that was restored over a 10 year period. But we're happy that we are now getting an in, in, that, that influence of funds into our maintenance or general fund. What else happened? Well, I call it the maintenance and override rollover funding scheme. It's referred to in the state budget. If, if for those of you that look at the governor's approved budget every year, there's a line under, item under K-12 um, education called rollover. The rollover refers to the skipped payment 
that the legislature authorized in the June 2009 fiscal year that said we don't have enough money to pay $931 million to public schools. We're going to defer it. We're going to not pay you in June. We're going to pay you in the new fiscal year when we have more money, which means we got skipped. And for the last the next 10 years, that renewal has been approved or reauthorized every single year. So we are still owed that skipped payment. For Vail, it's $3.1 million. We could, we could do a lot of things with $3.1 million. What else happened? Well, the, again, to balance the, the budget, the state said, well, we also have to put school capital the things, the transportation, the textbooks, the curriculum, the software licenses, the new buildings. And so we're going to start school districts out of that funding as well. Um, so for Vail, we had a budget of $6.2 million. They let us look at what our budget would be, and then they showed that reduction. And the first year is 53%. So we went, ha! We're giving up $3.3 million. We're supposed to have 6.2. It hurt. It hurt our hearts. Well, okay, we won't buy new buses. We will go to online um, instruction instead of textbooks. What else can we do? And so we tried to be very creative and get through that. By 2015 16, that reduction went from 53% to 85%. We were operating on 15% of our allowable capital needs because that's what the state did to us all public school districts. So from 6.2 million, we have 930,000, only $71 per student to spend for the entire year, right? That's been that, now there's a capital restoration plan and we're thankful for that. But what does that do? Over the next five years, our capital funding amount gets reset to 2014. It doesn't cover any of the lost capital, nothing. It doesn't even account for inflation. It doesn't put an inflation factor for future years. It says, we'll reset you, we'll make you whole in 2014. And we're going, thank you very much. Because there's nothing else we can do about it. So again, when, when you see your school district asking for an override or a bond, please look into it. And if you feel the school district's being responsible and fiscally um, appropriate, you know, support it. And if you don't feel that way, don't vote for it. But please at least look at it, get involved, and find out more about it. What else happened? The school facilities board funding got gutted. Then that's funding where if there's a catastrophic emergency, a flood, a fire, the electrical system, we had a building hit by lightning, blew out the entire electrical system, a million plus dollars to fix and rewire that. And our operations had to be moved off site for two months. That's, we went to the school board because we said, we, you know, we don't have the money. They didn't have the money either. The legislature had gutted the funding for that. And we went, okay, uh, so how do we, you know, cookies and, and bake sales only go so far when they're trying to pay for that kind of thing. So in summary, you know, we're a growing district for bail. Um, that has helped us in some way because at least we do get more uh, we have more pupils, which generates a little more revenue. But again, having more students means you have to hire more teachers and you have to have classrooms to house those. We've been approved by the state and you have you get approval only after you've been overcrowded. So you can't be proactive and say, we're gonna need it. The bridge is coming and there's no, there's no it's crossing on the other side. We have to go over the bridge and there, while that going, the bridge has to go out. So we've been approved for three new schools and we got funding for three new schools. What's the funding look like? It's about $120 per square foot. I don't know if anybody's in construction or in building. Um, and the school facility board mandates, dictates what we have to build. It says there's so much you have to have in a school. To do that minimal need requirement costs $240 a square foot. How does the school district meet that difference? There's bond. And so our local, our local residents have been so supportive, we're appreciative of that, but we know that time is, everybody's like at the max, and we're not sure we're gonna get approval to get the bond to help build the next school. So our bridge is out, and we're just, you know, we're hoping that the state will stop coming up with reductions, fully fund the reductions and restoration plans, 
and then fully fund and, and re restore the school facility for us. And that's our hope and hope that you support us with that. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. That's really interesting. It's right about the, the real world, <laughs> how this is all affecting all the real schools and schools. Um, John Petticone, um, he's currently an educational consultant. Um, he served as the superintendent of Tucson Unified School District until his retirement in, in 2013. Um, and prior to that, he was a distinguished senior faculty fellow at the Educational Leadership Program at the College of Education at the University of Arizona and the vice president of the Southern Arizona Leadership Council. Um, Dr. Pedicum retired from Flowing Wells School District uh, where he served as an administrator for 22 years. Um, his leadership there in the district um, included serving as a, a junior high school assistant principal, high school principal, and at that time, that his high school was selected as the number one school in the state, uh, State of Arizona A plus program, and it received the Department of Education's Blue Ribbon School Award. Um, and he was also the assistant uh, superintendent um, at that school as well. Yep. Yes, okay. <laughs> or that district. Um, he is a recipient of numerous and prestigious awards. Um, he earned his BA uh, with honors in English um, at St. Mary's College in Minnesota. We can skip all that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he's, he has a PhD in educational administration from the University of Wisconsin. So please help me in welcoming John. Thanks very much. Thanks. So, um, thanks. I'm, I'm dep are you depressed? Yeah. You know, I'm, you're looking at our faces. I've got to tell you, we're looking at yours. And, and this, is, this is what happens every time we talk about anything dealing with education funding. There's this, this look that comes across the faces of the people that we try to interact with, and it's the same feeling we have inside if, at, at, at displayed on your faces. Because the real dilemma is, what do we do about this? You know, it's dawning, and, you, and we get to the point where we look for some kind of solution to getting us out of this. And as I'm listening to it, I really appreciate uh, you know David for a long time, just a, a remarkable guy. And Lisa's presentation really lays it out. But the bottom line is, unless we figure out how to undo something that's taken 30 or more years to do negatively, we're going to continue to have this catharsis that results in, in, uh, in the same feeling I see in your faces. So I'm going to try to, to provide a little bit of hopefulness in, in this presentation. It'll be a little bit, it'll be a little tough because what they talked about is absolutely, do you believe what they said? Yes. Yeah. All right, I, I hope so. So, so the question that, that, that I have for you, first of all, I want to thank you for being here and uh, anybody else online for spending some time on Saturday morning to do this. And I appreciate the League of Women Voters for, for doing this. They do these kinds of things that make a, a significant difference in our community. And I see it happening time and time again, so I appreciate you being here and the organization for doing it. So why am I representing the business community? I've been a lifelong educator. I, as as uh, was said, I worked as a superintendent in two district, districts. Uh, one for 22 years as an administrator, then finally a superintendent of Flying Wells. Very, very different reputation than the second one that I spent about two and a half years in uh, serving as a superintendent. And I've got to tell you, my experience is that the quality of people in both districts are the same. The quality of people in Tucson Unified and the quality of people in Flowing Wells um, <laughs> exists at the same level. What is different about those two districts is the cultural things and the political things that y'all understand. So if some of the questions have to do when we start talking about efficiency with what's going on in Tucson Unified, then when you talk about doing the work well and, and being good shepherds of, of school finance, I can speak to that to, to some extent, and I'll try to. But I've got to tell you, um, you're going to find that, that uh, school districts across Arizona are experiencing the same dilemmas that you heard Lisa talk about and David allude to. So why am I representing the business community? Because I learned a long time ago, I can't do the work that we've got to do as school leaders without collaboration. And one of those primary groups that makes a significant difference in influence is that business community. And quite frankly, the business community has both advantage and disadvantage in the taxing system in Arizona. When I say the business community, that's an amorphous complex group. We have everything from small business leaders to corporate heads. Well, I can tell you that each is treated very differently in the tax structure in Arizona. And when we're passing a bond or override in, in a community like Flowing Wells, I'll use that uh, for this example, those business leaders are getting taxed who are small businesses, and by the way, the majority are small business leaders, at a significant level above what the individual resident is. So every time I had to make that decision to go forward with an initiative, I had to talk with them and make sure that I know what the impact is going to be on them. So when I say business community, I'm going to try to represent 
the SALC business community, which are the 105 or so, 105, I think up to 140 corporate heads, large, larger business leaders in this community. So let me talk about that um, a little bit. Um, I serve as the director of, of uh, SALC's educational arm, and uh, I'm charged with, pers with providing you a business perspective on a topic. SALC, the Southern Arizona Leadership Council, and it's a nonprofit corporation that's designed to bring those CEOs together to talk about economic development and quality of life in the region. They were formed many, many years ago. That's their purpose. And so they've got a long nonpartisan history of advocating for increasing and not reducing P20 education funding. It's interesting. If I were to ask you before I mentioned my comments, what you think the business community feels about public education, David alluded to it. They really support public education. But just like when you hear, see a politician in the paper say, my primary objective is education, I better read down the column to see what that means. Because in many cases, it's not something that you and I might agree is concern. It's something that looks very, very different. But in SALC's case, that's one of the reasons I began working with them when I was at the university, is my job was to inform them um, as much as I could what the perspective of an educational leader was when they talk about making the decisions that have an impact on us. And so I want to make sure that a gift is really a gift and not something else, okay? So that's why I'm doing this. Anyway, TVT was one of the organizational um, innovations that came out of SALC, Tucson Values Teachers. Um, they, they had early support for Proposition 301 and for Proposition 301's extension. Proposition 301, as was mentioned by Lisa and David a little bit, but Lisa really was this initiative that was passed by all of us way back in 2000 that said for 20 years, you know, we're going to provide support for uh, public school at this level. Well, the legislature, as Lisa said, said during the middle of that experience, no, we can't afford it, we're not going to do it. How can you do that? I mean, it's a law that that's what you're required to do. Well, they knew the strategy was, if I could just say no, I'll wait till litigation takes place, it'll give us some years to put it off, and then when it finally comes to bear, we'll deal with it. And that's exactly what happened. Unfortunately, um, that's the wrong way to do business. And quite frankly, SALC was out in front of that, and they said, you know, they, they supported the extension of Prop 301. Um, they led in the creation of First Things First. And first Things First is that law that allows for preschool funding, you know, that was the tobacco tech stuff that you remember and it came out of a, a statewide initiative that, uh, that, that really is, has done remarkable things for preschool children across Arizona. SALC led in that as well. Um, they championed what's called TRIF funding and that's the additional funding for universities as well and community colleges. And they supported Prop 123. But Prop 123 was that, that initiative that you heard about um, where Everybody agreed to do what Governor Ducey said we should do, and that's to take money from the state land trust. And I can't tell you all the details of that, and you probably know a lot of it, but the problem with that was that we were taking money to provide 70% of what was owed to us out of education funding that was, that was designated for education funding from the very beginning. But when you start moving into the corpus, the principle of that investment, now you're breaking the law, basically, and that's what this latest result of the, you know, of, of the, of the litigation uh, revealed, but what they came out in favor of, but only on this condition, and I was there when they did this, I promise you it's true. They said, we support one, two, three, but not as an education funding solution, but as a solution to a lawsuit. And it gives school leaders and districts some money that they wouldn't get otherwise. As Lisa said, you're desperate, so you'll take whatever you can get, and that's really unfortunate because we settle for things we shouldn't settle for. And then when we go down the road a bit, like we are, and we try to repair it, how do you recover from a five million billion dollar deficit? You can't afford that, neither can I. So when you start looking at the things David alluded to in terms of corporate credits and, cor and, corporate, uh, and corporate tax cuts, we've got to look in those areas as well as the general funding formula. But anyway, so that's the backdrop of, of what I'd like to tell you. So anyway, so here's what SALC believes, and these are what generally the, the corporate community believes here locally. We've got to find long-term sustainable funding solutions to improve education outcomes long-term sustainable funding solutions. Um, SALC is part of a statewide nonpartisan group, uh, was initiated through Helios, which is a, a statewide corporation, I mean a statewide non nonprofit foundation, and it was designed to bring business leaders and others together to take a look at what are some options for funding education in Arizona that we may not have thought about or that we have to consider. So one group of business leaders and others got together in Phoenix to explore that option. <clears throat> the other was a group of of business leaders, community members, and education leaders from across the state that said, if we were to get money, what are the priorities we should spend those dollars on? 
And so that was an interesting dynamic. I took that group and then the executive uh, 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 leaders in SALC went to the other group. And then we communicated together about what were the priorities that this that the one group said were important and in what order. And then the business group said, here are some options that we can look at for how much money we need and how, and how we can fund it and how we can, how we can do that differently. So that's been going on, and I think that's a very hopeful um, kind of activity that's been taking place for the last year and a half to two years. <clears throat> okay, they believe at SALC, and the corporate community honestly understands that P20 continuum is important, that it's not just one uh, group or another, it's gotta be a continuum from early childhood education all the way to post-secondary school. Um, can't focus on one segment at the detriment of the others. Again, um, the, the, the divide and conquer mentality, that we've seen expressed by our legislators for too long has got to stop. And so the business community is standing forward to say that's not something we can tolerate. Um, the beginning of the pipeline matters. And uh, honestly, that's one of the, the, um, the, the co-chairs of what was called the State Readiness Task Force was Steve Lynn. Steve Lynn is a local business guy who's part of SALC. And Steve and Nadine Basher were the two chairs. I was on that statewide committee as a superintendent. And from that grew this, the, the uh, First Things First concept where everybody understood. If we take care of our, our babies early, we prevent dropout later. If we don't, we guarantee it. So yesterday I was at a meeting in Phoenix called of the Arizona Business Education Coalition, and they spent a lot of time talking about the value of early childhood education. Why is that so important? And you just have to do a little bit of background. Um, and I know that this is an informed group. I, I love to look at chronologically mature individuals. <laughs> you not only have time to do the research to, to get at what really uh, is, is the truth, but you also have the wherewithal to go out and do something about it. Well, if you look at the impact of quality early childhood education on our children, especially when you look at a comparison between poor children and those that are not, the, the, the differences are significant. So one of the most recent, uh, and, and by the way, to that end, we've been part of, you probably read about the, 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 the group that got together to try to create a countywide preschool promise, they call it now, and it's where we're trying to fund preschool education in this valley. Well, we've been at the table since the very beginning of that. Um, okay, this, this was kind of interesting too, that I think research has shown that not only the attendees of high quality preschool benefit throughout their lives, but the children of those parents who attended high quality preschool enjoy higher educational attainment, less incarceration, higher wages, and better overall quality of life than those whose parents did not attend preschool. So it's really an investment over the, the life terms of our community. <clears throat> okay, and then while education funding in Arizona requires major steps, I have a hard time with this one, and I'm gonna say it, and I have to believe it, but I'm old, we all have a, a, uh, a shelf life, and mine is, is getting closer to expiration. So I'm less patient now than I was when I was younger, but, but, it, but it's a reality that we're, we've gotta do these things in steps. I just have to be willing, like you do, to say I can't do it all at one time, no matter how angry and frustrated I am, and SALC makes the point that we've got to take the small wins and work forward toward an ultimate goal. And I think that's important as well. So I mentioned yesterday I was at ABEC and I talked with the uh, executive director and president of ABEC, a guy by the name of Dick Foreman, and I asked him, I'm gonna to talk to this group this morning, what are some things that you'd like to communicate? And he said uh, that he, he wanted to point out um, uh, his business perspective from the state level. And he said, many of the same sentiments that I just expressed about SALC, he believes happen on a statewide level. But he further discussed uh, a great deal of activity going across sectors. And one of them was that the legislature is looking at tax reform to an extent. They're actually looking now at the potential of looking at property tax. You, 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 can, you know this. If you came from someplace else, I have a really nice home in Oro Valley. I'm really happy that I do. But if I had that home in Chicago where I came from, the taxes would be four times or five times what I pay here. And I'm not interested in paying four or five times the taxes that I pay now. But quite frankly, when you see that, there's a problem. My income taxes, I always pay, I have to pay more to the federal government every year, I always get money back on income. So that's being explored at the legislature, I think that's good. Community groups are getting together now to, to take a look at this in a way that hasn't happened before. I give a lot of credit to the Red for Red movement. They did what we could not do. As education and business leaders, they stormed the Capitol, okay, and they got the attention of a governor who on a Tuesday, and I, have, I don't want to talk badly about any governor, they deal with what they deal with. But on Tuesday, there's no money you know, percent and a half. On Thursday, there's 20%. Let me talk about 20%. So how much time do I have? I'm sorry. Two. Oh, okay, so let me do it real quickly. When you talk about 20 by 20, let me tell you what 20 by 20 means. 
It's 20% based on the funding level at the time it was implemented. 16-17. So when you look at 20% of that, and then you divide it over those three years, 20. What do you get? You don't get you don't get that 20% the next year. You get less of that based on what's left from that 20 and so forth until you hit 2020. On top of that, it was given for teachers only. And so if I'm a district uh, administrator, which I was and Lisa is, I have to take care of my other people. If you believe culture is all of us working together, how do I ignore them and not fund them when I'm funding teachers? You understand. All right, so anyway, the business community is seeking sustainable sources of, of revenue so that we don't have to go through this every year and I don't have to look at your frustrated faces like this every year. All right. Um, when David said, you know, we're, we're, we're so many billion below, um, we're $4,000 per pupil below the average in this nation for per, per pupil funding, $4,000. So Lisa mentioned 4,100 and something, it changes from year to year. We actually got one down this year by comparison to a few other years. <clears throat> we're $4,000 less than the national average in that area. So we've got to do something about that. So, um, okay, I've got other examples of that, but I'll, I'll end with this, that um, if we don't do something about this, and, and, and the answer to, to is, you know, we're gonna, I know we're gonna get questions about what do we do about it. If we don't make ourselves aware of the reality of the situation, accept the data to be true. Look at what it means to educate our children. Understand that if all we had to do was educate our kids in reading and writing and the things that you and I might argue education was, was funded to do, we would do a really, really good job. But what's been thrust upon public schools and business leaders understand this for all of these years has been some, an enormous task of trying to raise our children, quite frankly. And that's not what schools are designed to do. So let's get together, understand the reality, and then activate toward getting something to happen. Thank you. Um, so our first one, this is uh, something a lot of people have been talking about. There's a, a huge budget surplus in Arizona. Wouldn't know it, but we have, I know it's over a million dollars. Um, so is there any chance that some, some of that funding can be used for education? Um, I, I, I think it's, it's actually smaller. The budget surplus is about $640 million. Um, but that's still a lot. But um, of that, I think around 200 million is what's considered ongoing surplus, meaning you can use it, it it's expected to be there year after year. The rest, about 400 million, is what's considered one time money, so that it's a surplus for this year, but we're not going to have it the year after and the year after. So you can't use that surplus for ongoing things like teacher salaries and, and increasing the funding. So, so it's really about a $200 million surplus. Here's the thing. So I mentioned the, the two thirds vote to raise taxes. There's really only three ways that you can raise money to put into education from the state level. You can do a ballot initiative, which I think we'll probably see in 2020, um, ask the voters, um, or you can um, uh, use, when you have revenue surplus, put that money in, or you can get the legislature to try and raise taxes. I've already talked about how I think that's impossible. So really, when you have these revenue surpluses, we should be using that to invest, whether it's in education or healthcare or all the other things that we have funding shortfalls for. Unfortunately, last year, we did have a billion dollar revenue surplus. And as I mentioned, they did a $400 million tax cut. Um, so that is, that is what's so frustrating is when we have these revenue surpluses, those are really the only time that we have the opportunity to put more money into schools. This year we do have about a $200 million ongoing surplus, but just this last week, um, Senator Mesnard was uh, quoted as saying he is working on commercial property tax reform, basically wanting to cut corporate uh, business property taxes. And he said, well, we've got this $200 million surplus that we can use to pay for it. So, um, so that is, that when you have those opportunities with the surplus, we should all be speaking out and saying, we need to use that to put in education because the only other way you're gonna address these issues is through the ballot or trying to get two thirds of the legislature to increase taxes. 
Yes. So just very quickly, look, this is so totally unacceptable to all of us in this room, I think, that the way we make law in the state is more inclined to be through litigation and proposition than through legislation, right? So, so what the other thing we do, and I want to keep talking about solutions too, is we've got to get people into those positions that understand that and that look at it, um, education as an asset, not a liability. If the, if the perspective that you have, and I don't care what the social service agenda is or what area it is, it's got to be looked at something that provides quality of life for all of us. If you think it's okay to allow the students that are in disenfranchised neighborhoods to wallow in that, and nobody in this room does, then the only other alternative is to say we've got to do something about it. And so that's what public schools are designed to do, and every other social service does it. But we have to be able to say to ourselves, yes, it's going to take money, and we expect our legislatures, the legislators to do that. That's their responsibility as states, women and men, to do that kind of job, not rely on the community to come forward, activate, and by the way, make those propositions harder in many cases yes. to put forward, right. um, because that's not the way to create law. Um, so we know that corporations, their tax breaks are almost equal to the entire state budget. Um, how can this be changed in order to provide uh, more money for education? I mean, I'll take a whack at it. It's the answer is obvious. Is that we have to have the will to say we've got to start turning those back. And I'm telling you the truth. Corporate leaders understand that. You know, they're going to take what they, you know, what they get. I mean, let's, let's face it. It's the market. And if they're offered a, a benefit, why would they say no? Although there are some that have actually, across the country, that have resisted that, and I think you've read about that. But the reality is that if, if they come to a place where they're saying we're going to give you this tremendous benefit, they'll take it. But then they're faced with exactly what David talked about, and that's that I think he talked about to an extent that business leaders say we want to be able to recruit the best, finest employees in our, in our, to, our, to our business, but I can't do that if the educational product looks like it's it's negative, it's less, it's less than, uh, than it should be. So we know that we've got to invest in that. The trouble is the investment on the other side is harder to do because you're trying to get something back from, from those entities. So the answer is roll those, those, uh, those cuts back, take a look at wise tax reform that includes reasonable cutbacks and work together with the business community to do that. I really believe they're willing to look at all of those options now. Um, we've had a lot of questions about charter schools, so I'm wondering if um, somebody can briefly address this. How does how does the existence of charter schools and how much they have grown, how does that affect school funding overall? Yay. Um, so I, I'm a fan of um, parent choice um, and believe that charter schools and private uh, charter schools, private schools, homes, homeschooling, all has a place in our community. and. Um, that it's the parents' obligation to do what's best for their student. And um, so given that, though, I also believe that if we're now talking about public charter school versus a private charter school, private charter schools for profit and they charge and, and do whatever, a public charter school operates similar to a public school district. They get equalization and state aid um, for maintenance and um, operations and capital uh, to do their daily business. The difference is that public school districts are held to different standards. Um, public school districts have to have audits. We have auditors in the house three times a year. And we have to submit monthly reports to the Department of Education. We have to account and show that we're spending state revenue and taxpayer revenue um, appropriately and fiscally. Charters, public charters are not held to that same standard. Um, we as public school districts, and I, I know that this was kind of what uh, John was alluding to when he said that school districts have to provide certain services. Well, let me tell you very clearly, a public school district has to provide um, age three and four preschool handicapped students with services to intervene and get them ready for first or kinder or first grade or whatever. Um, and even if that family decides, great, you provided services for my three and four year old, um, speech delay or um, occupational therapy or physical therapy and, or, or any combinations of those, um, but I'm gonna now take my child to the charter school. Well, that's a burden on the school district in two ways. One, we cannot turn away three and four year old preschool handicapped children. And two, we only get funding for half of the students. 
So how do you provide those quality of intervention um, skills and needs at half ahead of funding? Charters do not have to have, they're not mandated to have programs that service preschool and cat children. The other um, kind of disparity is charters don't have to offer kinder services. They can say we offer first through fifth grade or first through seventh grade or first through twelfth grade. Well, kinder is not mandatory in the state of Arizona, but in a public school district, it is mandatory for that public school district to offer. And guess what? The funding is half ahead. So again, the um, you know, charters are great, again, they offer choice, but if it's a public charter receiving public state aid, and, and then line them up and let's all get treated the same with regard to oversight and mandates and with regard to funding. Let me, let me give Lisa's district, Val. You all know Val, just an excellent district with, with strong leadership. You know, Kel Baker's been there from 20, for 22 years since the district was 2,000 kids now there are 13,000? It's, it's actually 28 years now. 28 years. I mean, so it's a remarkable district and it's creative in many ways. You know, I, I really have great respect for the district and for the leadership the people that work there. So Val, uh, being an innovative district, looked at this charter concept. Charters get $2,000 more per year, David? At least. Correct? Right. Than, than we get in traditional public schools. So what do they get that $2,000 more for? Well, the argument was originally districts can go for by-elections and overrides and they have this advantage in some way. But but it's more than that. And so, by the way, if districts go for that and they fail, then they're, they're minus the dollars that they would need. And it used to be for extra things when it was first conceived. Now, it's to stay alive, okay? You can imagine the deficit environment. So when you don't pass those initiatives, for whatever reason, and it can be political win, there's a lot of reasons why they don't, then you're really in trouble. So, so charters get that additional $2,000 or more. So here are some of the things they get it for. Well, one of them is there's a there's a factor that the legislature put uh, for all children in Arizona to make it easier to provide support for special education students that have minor disabilities. So it's it's a, it's a weight. Well, they, they said rather than figure out all those small uh, kind of minor disabilities, we'll give a factor, a weight, to all children in all schools. Well, they give it to public schools. They also give it to charter schools that don't have special education students. For the most part, some do, but trust me, I, I could I could tell you a story about Gabriel Trejo, the superintendent in TUSD, went out to send secret shoppers out to many of the of the, uh, the charters in, in Tucson Unified. I think a remarkable thing that he did was last year, and he had these secret shoppers act like grandparents. They were administrators and parents, and say and they're going to enroll their kid, and they wanted to find out what the charter school said to them. So here's the, he said there were two things that he found all charters did. One was they had really good customer service where a week after the person went in there, they got a follow-up phone call, really smart, and they did some things that we could obviously learn from in all of our businesses and certainly public schools. The other thing they did was they said, hey, does your child have an IEP? An IEP is the Individual Education Program. And if they did that, they began to have this narrative. Well, you, you gotta know that we don't provide the services in our, in our charter school. Your, your public school does. And so they had this conversation with them, and they still called them a week later, but they also mentioned, by the way, did you find out about your public school services? So anyway, so they get money for special ed in, in, uh, in charter schools, and then they get another factor, which is just re remarkable. We get a little factor for transportation. Well, charter schools had some parents that were getting together to drive kids to school, and so they ended up saying, well, we gotta pay parents for that. Well, we can't, fix we'll just give them the same factor. Well, they don't transport kids in charter schools. So I, I, I only mention that not to say woe is me. We were a charter advocate when it first came out in the early days. I remember Lisa Graham Keegan, we tried to be good citizens. We're supposed to look at charters as opportunities to see what can happen when you remove some of their, their constraints. Trust me, that didn't happen. And so we begin to get a little sensitive about charters because it's not an equal playing field. Thank you. Uh, this is an interesting question. Do you guys know of any studies or any way to evaluate the benefits of um, tax cuts on our public schools? Have you seen any evidence-based research on this from that side? Uh, I haven't seen any studies I, that I can think of offhand. All I can say is that when you look at the states that uh, have cut the most taxes, they tend to be the same states that are near the bottom of education okay. funding. Um, and um, I would also say you know, there was talk about like the recession and, and the recession obviously was kind of the impetus for the big tax or for the big education funding cuts but we would have been much better shaped to, to prepare for the recession had we not cut 
taxes for 20 years before that recession. And so those tax cuts, when the recession does come, make it worse. And, and, the state, and, and you know, we are gonna see a recession here in the next you know, couple of years. We are right now in the period, longest period of economic growth. And, and all economic experts predict that there's gonna be a recession and we are still cutting taxes and we are still not back to where we were at the last recession. And so, um, the, no, there's no studies, but I would just say that, um, you know, it, it, you can see the comparisons between education and funding and, and tax cuts in those states. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in Vail, I can speak to, I can think of, you know, one or two um, situations where an appropriate tax cut, maybe on a case-by-case -case basis, did benefit the district. And the most recent example is Amazon. Amazon, the new distribution center, thousands and thousands of square footage, is in the Vail School District um, bathroom. And so with, you know, with that, understanding that um, Vail will not realize 100% of the um, commercial property tax that it could have had, we are at least benefiting by some additional property tax but also, because it's in our boundary, we also are seeing a benefit in homeowner purchase, and, and that contributes to our uh, growing student enrollment. So I, it's not a case study, but that's an example where applied appropriately, judiciously, then it can, there can be a benefit. We can partner together, but the across the board, you know, slashes in education and, and reductions um, to uh, just whole categories and tax exemptions for certain frivolous or politically motivated categories, that's not helpful. One thing I would add to is being a former legislator and someone who's been around the, the state capitol for a long time, it's always frustrating to me that our lawmakers really don't have that long-term vision of where we want to go as a state. And so certainly there might be times when tax cuts are good and they make a, you know, they would you know, strategic tax cuts would be good for business, but you never see that kind of dialogue at the Capitol. It's usually legislators are just trying to think, what can we do to get to our next election? And and not saying, okay, if we're gonna cut this tax, how much is get that gonna cost us down the road? And how is that going to impact our ability to invest in education in five, 10 years? You don't see sort of that long-term vision from any of our lawmakers. And that's really, I think, one of the biggest things that we're missing in this state is, yeah, maybe there might be time for a certain tax cut that would be beneficial, but we don't we don't do things in the big picture. We don't like fit that in into to how that's gonna impact where we wanna go as a state, where we want our workforce to be. That's, that's good. Um, so do you think, does anyone think it's possible that we could have a citizen initiative, something like, similar to like outlaw dirty money, that could reverse that 1992 law that requires a two-thirds uh, majority to raise taxes. Is that possible any way to reverse? That's the only way to reverse it is to go back to the people because it's in the Constitution and I think it's um, going to be something we should address. And I don't think we can do it in 2020, but I think 2022 or in the future, I think uh, I and I think our organization thinks that it's, it's really important because um, there's the only way we're ever going to, I think, really be able to have meaningful discussions about raising revenue is if that is not there. And that's not to say if, if it goes away, you know, you're going to be raising taxes left and right, but it, 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 it frees the hands of the legislature, legislator, legislature to make those decisions. And if we don't like the fact that they're cutting taxes all in, or if they're increasing taxes, we can vote them out. We still have that opportunity, but you know, it's really, I think, crippling our ability to raise the revenue that we need. And I, I really think that that provision is such a key thing that needs to go. It's kind of the way nervous was to work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we saw in David's presentation that, um, you know, the number one issue for a lot of, um, for all businesses here is, is increasing uh, education. Do we see corporations or business leaders, are they lobbying the state capital about this? Yeah. And what's the reaction from the state legislative? Well, I can speak, David, you've been on this piece as well. I, I can speak for the people that I, that I try to represent here in this room, that they absolutely are, they're, they're advocating it in a careful way because they're, they're coming up against 
um, a political storm of no, no, no taxes, kind of a no tax referendum. And so they're saying, let's take a look at it with uh, a, a thoughtful, strategic eye, and, and let's see if we can come up with other funding sources. Every time they mention in this group, and by the way, there's there's two, or there's actually three major uh, business groups across Arizona. One is in northern Arizona, one is Phoenix, and the other is in southern Arizona, us. The one in Phoenix is the Phoenix, Phoenix Greater Leadership, or Phoenix Leadership Council. Phoenix Leadership Council is much more uh, diverse in their thinking um, than we are down here in southern Arizona. And there have been serious battles um, in, in that organization in particular about how much money they feel should be generated and how. So that's good, I think, because while they're having their internal problems, it isn't about funding itself. It's about how it gets done and how much. So the answer to the question is yes, they are having serious conversations with the governor involved in this and legislators involved as well. But the business leaders have great authority and influence in that, in that, in that arena, and they really are. David, would you agree that you, you see more activity now than I've seen in 20 years? Yeah, I think so. Um, so our group, the Arizona Center for Economic Progress, was part of the Invest in Ed ballot initiative last year that was removed from the ballot. And our coalition is stuck together, and, and we are looking at you know, a possible ballot initiative for 2020 and bringing something back. And um, I know that we've been encouraged, and, and some members of the business community that have that talked to us and and, and you know want to, to participate in that. You know, it remains to be seen. But I think you know I think there are certain pockets of the business community that are supportive, and then there's certain organizations that you know just want don't want to see any tax increases, and 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 you really are not going to get to where we want to be in funding education unless we have some sort of tax increase. There's just no, no way to do that. So you, the Arizona Tax Research Association, ATRA, is one of those groups. The other is the Arizona Chamber. They just feel differently than business leaders that I think are directly involved with their communities, like the folks that we're talking about. So. Um, this is one uh, for Lisa who wants to know, uh, who are the people moving to mail? What are the uh, demographics? Um, uh, according to our principals who are meeting with the uh, new community members and bringing their students in, uh, it's, it's a gamut. Um, we have retirees, uh, age 55 plus, that are, are moving in to enjoy uh, getting away from the city, the suburban uh, uh, hotspot. Uh, we have professionals earning 100,000 plus uh, coming from Caterpillar, coming from um, the mine that may or may not still be opening Rosemont, um, through Raytheon, through um, we have retirees that had a tour of duty through Davis Monthan, or um, who have heard about the excelling school district and the exceptional special ed services because it is uh, very unique and um, um, very thoughtfully rolled out. And we have folks coming in from around the country to study uh, how we deliver those services. So it, it runs again. And then we have, um, you know, pockets of people that are the, um, you know, the, the, the fringe on the, on the way other side where it's, you know, this is my property, I don't believe in taxes, and I'll, I'll you know, I'll show you what I think. So it, it runs the gamut. <laughs> it's like any diverse community should. Um, we've all got some questions about um, businesses. Uh, but one is, so we know that Arizona offers all these tax cuts to businesses moving here. Um, how effective is that? You know, how many are moving here? We know like Caterpillar and a few others. Are there any others who are saying, you know, that at state of education funding, we don't want to move our business here? Yeah, I mean, I think I think what what my, my experience working with business leaders is that. I can't tell you, I mean, Caterpillar's a good example. There have been a number of Amazon coming in. There's a number of different uh, efforts that uh, what used to be called TRIO uh, works toward trying to recruit uh, companies to come into Arizona. But I think David's point is well taken that if we've done all of this effort to try to have uh, tax breaks for large corporations and others over the past 15 years, 20 years, we look at the results of that. And when the results of that are that we have an underfunded education system, that clearly that's not working. It's not certainly not working the way in which the trickle-down concept is suggests that it will. It just doesn't. So um, I think there's an understanding that uh, they're still going to provide incentives. They're going to offer these incentives to companies that are 
willing to come to Arizona. But I think there's much more critical eye now on, on how that happens, and I, I hopefully uh, there'll be a little bit less inclination to offer things that are not sunsetted or that don't have some opportunity for revenue to begin to flow back into the system. And if I can just add, there's, you know, I don't have information on businesses that have chosen not to move to our area, but I can tell you there, I believe there's a correlation between that and it's happening and uh, our ability to recruit from out of state um, for Vail, and I know we partner with a lot of the Southern Arizona school districts. Uh, we used to go on these recruiting junkets and I would be gone for weeks at a time going through the Pacific North West and then you know heading over to the east coast where we took ice scrapers as giveaways saying you won't need this if you move to Arizona. <laughs> we gave out hot sauce and um, so, you know shades and um, all sorts of things and we were very successful at recruiting out of state teachers who were graduating that wanted to move to Arizona and be part of you know the things that we could offer and when we had all our awards and we had our philosophy and they're like yes. Um, and there are still people that want to come and join the team, but you know the, the the news of us being last in the nation and how poorly funded um, our students are, our people, and where the state what the state sentiment is about public education uh, that out of state teacher recruiting is non existent now. We only get people as they come to us. It's no longer successful or even financially affordable um, to go out of state and do these recruitment events. And, and that's sad. That's very sad because they're great candidates. And, and I would just say, you, you hear a lot of success stories you know, here and there on the news about corporations coming to Arizona. And there are, there, there's, some, there's some good stories, but I don't think we're at the level at, at some states that are um, getting major corporate headquarters and other things, and and um, I've had conversations with you know the people whose job it is to go to other states and recruit businesses to come here. Chris Camacho is the head of the Greater Phoenix uh, Economic Council, and he said publicly that when he goes to other states, that the biggest concern he has hears is the quality of our education system and the quality of our, our workforce. And and even we even though we might be recruiting well today. When you have one of the highest incarceration rates in the country, um, and we have one in five children in Arizona living in poverty, and one of the lowest funded public education systems, what does that say for our future? Is it sustainable? Even if we're getting companies here now, what it's going to be like in five or ten years? And that, I think, is, is really what should be raising alarm bells for a lot of us, because that's our future workforce. And, and, and that's what's going to happen in the future if we're not addressing some of these issues now. Time for one more? Yes. Okay. Um, so someone asked, uh, they said that they don't think Arizonans know much about the reasons for um, these cuts or the, the state of funding. I think a lot of people know about it because I've read for Ed, but don't know the specifics. So how do we change that, that information done so to get the word out about how this all happened and what we can do? It's a really great question. Um, the uh, one of the challenges that, as a school district, you know, we put a lot of effort into educating or attempting to educate our local community. And we go out for an override or a continuation of an override, or we go out for a bond, or we just, you know, we bring them in and say, we want to build a new school. We have funding. Here's how much we can do as a community. What do you want us to do? What do you want us to offer your children? Um, and so. Just, just from experience, educating people who have an interest and an investment and a desire to support schools, it is so complex and so darn hard to provide that explanation. I, I don't have a reasonable solution. I'm just like in agreement. It, it's hard. And then the legislative um, uh, commentary really focuses on one thing at a time. So to the to the kind of um, common and usual taxpayer, it can get blurry and it can give it, you know, it was one, two, three, what about 301? What about 206? I mean, you know, who the heck knows after all that time? Uh, and there's no central repository for information where you can go say, well, go look that up. I'm happy to post ours, but, you know, it, it, I don't have a solution. Be open to suggestions. So the beginning of this meeting, 
where you heard a little of the backdrop and the feeling that you had when you heard it is the concern that we all have about how to do exactly what you're asking us to do. Um, how do you get people not to get wary and to, and to have this catharsis that occurs when you, you hear all this information and you want to know more, and it's a hard and complex topic. So my opinion is that the only way that you get this to change is to, be, is to get people to realize that if you don't like what's going on, you've got to, you've got to express your opinion at the ballot box. You've got to do it with your vote. But also, why we spend so much time working with business leaders? Because their voice is louder than ours. I'll be real honest with you. Your voice, by the way, is loudest of all, all of us together. When we say something as a community, it makes a difference because those people that are making those decisions care about getting reelected and all the stuff that we all know. But the business community standing side by side with the education community can speak volumes to what we do to persuade people and the legislators to do what's right. Um, it takes money, it takes re you know, resources to get that to happen. Uh, look what's going on with Prop 205. I don't know where you stand on all of that, but there's a lot coming out on the television. If you oh, if you if you watch The Price is Right, which I'm not in my advanced age I'm able to do, you know you you see these advertisements for this stuff, and it's appealing to those of us that have time to to understand it a little bit better. So I think it's standing side by side with all constituencies to scream loudest in the ways that we can do that to make sure people know. I just want to say, and I want to compliment the League of Women Voters and say, keep doing what you're doing, and I want to give you an example. Um, at the legislature, and I, I think some of you are aware of this, there's a request to speak system, and there's legislation that comes up. And um, I, as a legislator, when this system was first announced, well, created, you know, this was back in 2008, 2009, you would just see like three or four people signing up to express their opinions. Last year, and I, I know that the League of Women Voters was really responsible for this, it was so incredible to see how many people from the League of Women Voters were signed up in opposition to bills, tax cuts, or signed up in favor of positive bills. Um, they were just lists and lists. If you go on that system, you can see. And to the point, I think it was a record number of people that signed in to, to you know, weigh in their opinions on those bills. To the point that you know some legislators thought that they were just bots that were being created that they were like they were saying that that was just like fake people because but it was changing votes you were the, when you see all of those people that are listed you know those legislators that are in the middle that are on the fence it changes their opinions because they see people are watching they're paying attention so keep doing it. Well, help me uh, thank our panelists uh, one last time. This is David Lehman, Lisa Cervantes, and John Pedro. Thank you.